just hit 11 now, so I'll just give another 30 seconds or so for more people to join. Well, that was her. Oops. Okay, hi everyone. Um, welcome to this first session of our newly forming BC uh, Community of Practice for Patient Engagement in Clinical Trials. And this first session today is actually a presentation. So um, we've opened that up to a wider audience. Um, we will be recording the presentation and the discussions today for those that can't attend and posting them on the BCHSN website, um, most likely in the BC Support Unit Resources section and potentially on Clinical Trials BC website as well. I would, I, we have people coming from all across BC joining us today and nationally across Canada. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land that I work and on which I work and live and play is the traditional and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Kwantlen, Pitsi, Semiamu, and Tawasim First Nations. Um, just a little background, the idea for our community of practice grew out of some discussions between the BC Support Unit Vancouver, Fraser Regional Centre, and Clinical Trials BC, along with two patient partners uh, who are here with us today. Um, and, and those folks and some uh, clinical research investigator, we started talking a lot about patient engagement in clinical trials and then participated and hosted a panel at the Clinical Trials BC conference two weeks ago. That recording will become available next week on the Clinical Trials BC website. But this, this community of practice that we're looking to form is a result of that collaboration. And we do invite anybody interested in, invite, in advancing their learning in this area of patient engagement specific to clinical trials. Um, we invite you to join our, our monthly meetings that will be, we expect a combination of informal discussions and chats, journal reviews perhaps, hosted speakers and more. And the members will develop this based on the needs of the community. But for today, we are really pleased to host a presentation a met on focused on methods um, followed by some discussion. And the title of this talk today is Co-Design in Clinical Trials with Patients. And here to speak to us about that is Nick Bansbeck, who is an Associate Professor in the School of Population and Public Health at UBC. And Nick is also the co-lead of the Health Economics and Simulation Methods Cluster at the BC Support Unit. And I see Nick, Mark has joined and Mark Harrison is an Associate Professor in, a, in Faculty of pharmaceutical sciences at UBC. Over to you, Nick, and thank you and Mark for speaking to us today. Great, thank you. I'm just gonna, uh, I think you'll see Mark. Do you wanna wave Mark? He's, I had to send him the invite, so he's got the same name, just to confuse you all. Um, but um, uh, I'm Nick and um, I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna do like a short presentation. I don't want this to be sort of like a formal presentation. I thought this would be a little bit more informal We'll talk for tw 20 minutes and then like we won't go into sort of details of the methods, um, uh, but happy to sort of answer questions afterwards or have, to have a broader discussion afterwards about this sort of topic. So I hope that's OK. I'm going to share my screen and I'll start off and I think I'll uh, I'll hand over to Mark sort of halfway through just to give you a different voice to, to listen to. So hopefully you can see that, perhaps give me a thumbs up. Okay, so just some uh, acknowledgements. I think um, this is a, a project that was funded by the BC Support Unit, um, the methods cluster that I sort of co-lead um, around sort of health economics. Um, and arguably I shouldn't be the person who's talking about this, but 
Um, this really was a, a sort of team effort. And uh, here is a, a list of the team members, uh, in, including our, our patient partners. Um, and actually, the, the story of this, this project starts with our patient partners, actually a conversation with, with one of them at a conference, uh, a scleroderma conference, um, where there was a bit of frustration about the talk about new trials and how the patients weren't really being engaged with, with those trials. And that sort of like stemmed the sort of a, a beginning of conversations quite a few years ago, which have led us to sort of this sort of methods project with a kind of case study. And it's included a, a whole um, bunch of, of people, including Marie Hudson, who's out at the bottom, who's at McGill, who is a trialist who does um, design trials in, in this space. Um, but just, so I'm gonna set up the problem and sort of the idea that we approach this with. And um, then I'll hand over to Mark to give us some sort of uh, the, the case study of, of what, where we've got to so far. But uh, the problem that we're trying to address here is that we spend a whole bunch of money on, on clinical research, on trials. And like, there's a lot of question marks about whether that offers good value for money. Like, so I'm an economist, I look at, this from a sort of a, uh, an economic lens. And that, that suggests that if we're wasting money on, on a trial over here, that means that money can't be spent on something that might be more useful. And so how can we sort of like optimize and really invest our money in, in the best um, way to ask, actually really gonna improve the health of, of our populations. And um, uh, someone called John Ioni Nidis wrote a, quite a provocative paper um, a few years ago. And um, in it, he sort of said that most clinical research is not useful. And uh, he gives this sort of like quote at the bottom. And it's, he, he brings a whole bunch of reasons about why clinical research isn't useful from, um, from, from the start, from the question that's being addressed through to sort of it not being accessible. Um, to actually change any sort of practice. But if you just look at the last line here, um, it really strikes a, a note with me. He argues that, that a lot of clinical research fails not because of its findings, but because of its design. And just to go kind of push that a bit further, I think we'd argue that, that many clinical trials study interventions that, that patients might not actually want to use even if the studies are a success and it depends on how you define success, but often trials are, a successful trial is defined by whether it meets its primary endpoint. And that's what uh, de determines whether it gets published in a big journal, whether it makes a splash on the newspapers. But, but sometimes, and there's good evidence to this, those primary endpoints aren't important to patients. They're, they're something that might have some clinical meaningful uh, meaning, but but for patients, they're they're just one factor, but not the maybe the most important factor. Maybe this sort of effect size, so the the improvement that the study is being designed around isn't isn't big enough to be meaningful. We see lots of trials of very small sort of uh, improvements that are being studied. Um, um, perhaps they don't give all the information that's needed, so they might focus on one outcome but not ignore some of the side effects, for example. And so it's successful trial, but it has potentially some side effect that we don't know about. So is that really success? And then if you try to weigh this together, like is the actual the benefit uh, that's being seen actually big enough to compensate for some of the risks? And then lastly, and there's other things as well, but it could also be just that the, the, the treatment or the intervention is just not practical, like the delivery you have to travel, you have to use an injection. There's various reasons that actually this successful trial may not be useful. And I think this also contributes sort of further earlier on. It actually is, there's many reasons for why uh, patients don't participate in trials. But if, if the trial isn't studying an intervention that you actually would like to use, then that's a, a pretty reasonable reason for, for why um, people don't participate in clinical trials. So if we just sort of step back and think about um, 
away from health, how do we design things? And sort of like try and take, uh, consider this from a, from a non-health perspective and then sort of reframe it. That's what we did in this project a few years ago. And if you look at sort of consumer good development, things like cars and phones and things like this, they, they start off with an idea that is sort of initially screened to see whether this is something that people would like, maybe some prototypes developed, and then there's this market research, actually going out to the people who might purchase this good and say, you know, would you, would you actually buy this? And what are the features that you would want for this to be important to you sufficiently so that you will be willing to spend some of your own money on it? And then that market research will develop some tests so see actually what we can actually make, how does it actually work in practice, and then go on, develop it, and, and if, if all goes well, enters the market. And just like these, these just looking at the, the costs of these stages, you know, it costs money to sort of do this testing and then develop a market entry. And so you wanna be sure that you're developing a product um, that is going to be sold, like, like, like the people will want to buy it uh, before you actually put it out into the market. And often um, this market research suggests that actually, you know, our prototype isn't working. So we need to sort of redevelop the prototype, change it somewhat. And maybe it's prototype two that you go, goes forward, or maybe it's not. And maybe you have to create prototype three. And actually that's the one that seems to be um, um, the one that's going to likely to work. Or you might just get to a stage where, you know what, this isn't going to happen. So let's just can this now. Let's not go and waste money on developing something that people don't actually want. Now, if you take the same perspective into the health uh, realm, I think you similarly have ideas that are screened and prototyped. But what we would argue is that the market research part is missing. Or there is market research that often happens, but it often is not with the end users, the consumers, the patients that are actually um, the, the, the intervention is for. And so we go forward with testing with, um, with these interventions and then developing them and putting that into the market. But we don't necessarily know whether it's something people would want. And some people can argue that actually this is what peer review does, but I've sat on many peer review panels and I can tell you that's not what peer review is doing. Peer review is trying to see whether a trial is designed in a sort of like the appropriate way. It's not understanding whether this is actually something that people want. Um, and so the trials are the testing stage there and actually the market research seems to actually happen once it's out into the market. So we develop this, we've spent all this money on a trial, it comes up with successful results. And then we find that actually patients don't really want it. And what a waste of resources that potentially is there. And this is like trying to sort of ex give the example of um, why Ioannidis suggests that much research is not useful. Um, and so what do, what happens in market research? So like, very crude example of how, when they developed phones, they ask people questions. They, with these prototypes, they ask them, well, how important is, you know, battery life and cost and how much memory in the camera? And they ask people to sort of trade off in these types of questions to actually help disentangle which components of a product are important and how important must they be in order for me to sort of pay three, four hundred dollars for that product. Actually, it's a sort of famous story that the iPhone, when it was first developed, they delayed actually manufacturing it until they knew they could get 10 hours of battery life because they knew that was the magic number they needed um, before it was going to be considered valuable enough for people to um, spend their money on. And sometimes I'm not sure I even get 10 hours out of my phone these days. But, but anyway, in theory, that's what what they should be doing. And so what our approach is, is trying to do is to sort of how can we consider these techniques of market research earlier on in the process? 
and we're using a case study of patients with scleroderma where there is some exciting new developments in, developments in stem cell therapies. Um, and we want to sort of think through how can we design a trial, a future trial um, that might be more uh, in, appealing for patients um, in the end. And I think just before I hand over to Mark, just to give you the heads up, Mark, that you're, it's coming your way. Um, it's, uh, I think we're, we're just being realistic here, like we're focusing on pragmatic kind of modifiable factors here. Like there are, there has to be some constraint to what is being considered. And so we're thinking about things in the design that can be changed rather than just sort of opening everything else up. And so I'll uh, hand over to Mark and let you, well, actually, no, I'm controlling the slides. So perhaps you talk, Mark, and I can uh, do the slides and you can uh, uh, keep us going forward. Does that sound okay? Sure, I think you should be able to predict when, I'm, when I need to change. <laughs> so thanks, Nick. Yeah, so this, um, our case study hangs around a trial that was done a few years ago and published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And if you if you kind of cast your, ma your mind back to when Nick was saying about the, the project we were involved in being initiated by conversations with patients and a clinician, I was, I was at a meeting where experts were getting together about this new stem cell therapy and how we could sort of move towards implementation in Canada. Uh, and so they talked about this Scott trial. It was a, a big trial designed for 226 participants and Stem cell therapy is quite a risky um, but potentially effective treatment. And they designed this trial with event-free survival as the primary endpoint. Um, in reality, though, they had really low recruitment. So they only managed to recruit about 33% of the people they intended to. So because they could only get 75 people, they first tried to broaden the entry criteria to try and get more people into this trial. And when that failed, they they then sought ways to try and work out how they could run the trial with this reduced sample size that they had. And what they ended up doing was changing from uh, event-free survival as the primary endpoint to this global rank composite score, which kind of evaluates a number of different outcomes in order. And it ranges from survival um, right through to the Rodman skin score at the end, which is, is kind of just an indicator of skin involvement. And the, the results they come out with, I always, I always feel a bit nervous talking about this because it's really hard, or I find it really hard to understand, but I think that's okay because that was, that was kind of the point that the clinicians and the patients were making to me is that in a, in a clinical consultation, it's really hard to use this information to guide what's, what's coming out of the trial. And if you, if you think about all the different outcomes you've got, so survival, event-free survival, um, various things right through to that skin, skin involvement. I think what happens is you make pairwise comparisons of everyone in the trial and then evaluate each outcome in order. So if you look at panel A, you can see that there's, there's the black um, section at the bottom. Um, and out of the 75 people in the trial, there were, there were 17 deaths. So those, those black sections just indicate that there were 17 people in that trial who did worse than 58 others. And then you can see how they're distributed between the two treatment arms. And ultimately what they did was they looked at the, the median score on this global rank composite score and looked across at that, that 50 point and found that for the transplantation group, uh, it was 17, uh, whatever that means in practice, and it was negative six for cyclophosphamide. So there's an indication that the transplantation group was doing better and that's how they evaluated the trial. I think we'll move on from that. Nick. <laughs> so that kind of led to led to us trying to understand whether whether there was something in the design of that trial um, that might have helped the trial initially hit its participation or its uptake uh, recruitment targets, um, and whether there was something in the in the type of research that we do could, that could help people try and work out if there's something ahead of time that they could modify which would help that process of recruiting people into trials and then ultimately having trials designed to um, evaluate things that are of interest to people. So our approach was um, to do a discrete choice experiment which was very similar to the example that Nick showed you with the camera 
Um, and the good thing about this, like it was a, it was a completely patient um, involved project from the outset, but the process is that we first need to understand what's important to people to know what's put into those kind of experiments. Um, so we, we co-designed patient focus groups to try and see what should be put into those choices. Um, and this was quite interesting, the things that came out, and you can see the rank of, of themes that came out of the focus groups that we did with patients. Um, the most important thing was this support of a multidisciplinary team through the recovery from um, the stem cell treatment. So they were talking about kind of social, emotional, um, a, a broad range of supports for them as they, as they um, recovered from a treatment or considered going in for a treatment. And they were talking about things uh, like a broad range of issues, but also things around isolation and, and how it's a difficult decision and it can be quite a lonely decision. So this support was really important to them. They also talked a lot about logistics, so how costly to them individually it was to try and consider going for this treatment. And then there was a, a sort of layered, layered on logistical concern about having to uh, travel for treatment. So it's often offered in specialist treatment centers, which may be quite far from, from home, which is a logistical concern in its own right, and then layers like less a multiplier effect with the financial risks as well. So when they're thinking about financial risks, it's, it's coming out of their pocket and they're thinking about how, how they're going to have to deal with that final financial risk. Would you have to borrow money and do things like that? Then we get onto uh, knowledge and evidence. So how, how good are the estimates that people are showing? Um, is the data that the information that they're being told based on Canadian data, like people, or, you know, close to home evidence, or is it international data? How good was the experience of people who've undergone the treatment and what the doctor would recommend? And then finally, they got onto sort of the, the physical risk of treatment um, and the effectiveness of benefits, which are kind of the things that we tend to to think about as researchers as, as starting out like we, we think the the outcomes are the most important to people rather than these um, other supporting aspects like you know financial risk logistical concerns and things like that so ranked five out of six was the um the thing that was most closely linked to or relating to the primary primary outcome of the, the Scott trial. So that was a really interesting part of the, the project for us. We, we assume this would be the first as well because we come from that perspective, um, but it ranked quite far down the list of, of things uh, that people were telling us they were most concerned with. So once we had all that information, we, we put it into the discrete choice experiment, um, which I'm just gonna show you briefly here. Um, we kind of use word in, in in um, consultation with our patient partners on the project to try and communicate that in a clear way. Um, and then people would make choices between two different types of stem cell transplants or doing no stem cell transplant for now. So two times treatment or doing nothing. And once people have made a series of choices along, that, uh, along those lines, we can then try and stand um, what what's important to people if we send this out to a big panel of patients. Uh, we've we've been careful, like this has been a big learning experience for, for us going through a, a sort of fully patient involved project as well. So we've been careful to try and document what we've done and what we've learned from this patient oriented approach as well. So we had a, had a couple of publications in the patient recently, um, one that was kind of more about the research process, which is the top paper um, published by my postdoc Magda. Um, and then really, really um, pleasingly, Tiasha Birch, who's our patient partner, she really, she wanted to give an accompanying, accompanying piece, which kind of laid out her experience of being involved in the research project as well, and, and what had gone well, and what had gone perhaps less well. So we're try, uh, trying to have two companion pieces for other people who are interested in taking this approach forward to see what we did and then a, a sort of independent perspective on what went well and why, and if things had gone less well, why those had gone less well as well. So we're trying to disseminate as we go about what we're learning from the process. In terms of the survey, we, we worked with um, SPIN, who've got a huge um, 
a huge panel of people with scleroderma who, who respond to surveys quite a lot. So we, we put our survey out to 278 people. Um, we got a range of responses back from um, people with different types of scleroderma, including those who would be candidates for this kind of treatment if their condition was severe enough. Um, good representative sample across the board and we had responses from across the world. So almost half from Canada, but we also had about six, seven other different countries as well responding. And what we found is that actually when people were starting to make trade-offs between all of those things that we were told were important, outcomes actually were one of the one of the big priorities. So if you read this from left to right, you can sort of see the as we travel from left to right, the more influential things in people's decision making. So the years without further organ damage, which is kind of a closely related to the primary outcome, that was that was looking like the most important, as well as the complications. But then in the middle, we got to cost, uh, the distance of the treatment center from home, and then things like the experience of the surgeon and, and members of the care team to the, to the right-hand side. And although they weren't the priority, they were actually influencing people's outcomes. So we can use this information on preferences to try and predict whether people would take a treatment um, and the first thing we did was try and replicate the uptake rate of the Scott trial. So we, we used attributes from the, the choice, or sorry, descriptive words from those choice sets to try and replicate Scott trial. And we found with the type of um, outcome that they were looking at in that trial, we were able to do a pretty good job of predicting that 33% percent uptake from the trial based on the preferences that we got from from people with scleroderma then what we did is we tried to adapt um, hypothetically adapt the scott trial and say if they'd change some of the things which are kind of modifiable and um, so not the not the primary outcome or some of the risks um, but if we if we said the treatment was being offered nearer to home or at less cost to the individuals who are being asked to undergo the treatment. We then predicted uptake from that kind of adaptation. And we saw that there was a, an uptake, sorry, an, an improvement of potential uh, participation in the trial from about 33%, potentially up to about 45, 50% in, in that scenario. So this gives us a, a feel that if we try and understand what patients prioritize and what's important to them as well, alongside primary outcomes and risks of treatments, that we may be able to help people who are planning trials uh, to design something that's more likely to hit the recruitment rates that they've got in mind, but are also more relevant to, to the patients that we're trying to do the research for. So what we've learned is that we, we think that co-design in itself is um, is a value because obviously it's involving people who uh, are ultimately going to benefit from the trial or want to use the treatments that we're looking at. Um, but we think they, they, the involvement of patients helps us identify aspects of, in, of treatments that are really important to patients but may be missed by clinicians. Uh, we think we can predict uptake of interventions and perhaps try and use that to anticipate recruitment to further trials. And in a, as a bundle, this might help us work with people to help design trials that have a, a better chance of being useful in practice. And actually what we're proposing is relatively um, inexpensive and it's quick to achieve compared to actually doing with the, the clinical studies themselves. Uh, we have some kind of slow down specific uh, findings that multidisciplinary teams and helping patients with the logistics of in, being in a trial or having treatment is going to be in, important. Um, and then this has given us quite a lot of excitement about whether we can use this approach more broadly to help people in any kind of realm who are looking to conduct trials and see whether we can work with them to, see, to, to try and design more patient-oriented trials uh, and, and to help the recruitment process and the design process in future. But yeah, we'd love to hear from you about what your perspective on the work is. So thanks. Thanks, Mark. And just you know, we, we're going to put some results of this, like we're still sort of in the, the middle of it. It's still 
uh, well, we're nearly at the end. We're trying to get it published right now, but we'll put those results on, on our website and um, please sort of feel free to sort of reach out for if you've got ideas or questions um, about that. And we're happy to answer the questions about the particular study now, but also happy to sort of just have a broader conversation about the topic. So don't feel like we have to sort of focus in on this specifically. We're really just keen to sort of use this as an opportunity to start, start these kind of conversations, which we think could be so valuable uh, for our community. That's fantastic. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Mark. Um, I hope we do have a lot of questions. I'll monitor the chat um, as well as if anybody would like to, if they have any questions, to put their hand up. I'll have a look around. And Nick, maybe we can stop the screen share and then we'll be able to see more of the people. Um, so is there anybody that has a question? And if not, I do have one that I could kick us off with. Let me see. don't see anyone at the moment. Um, but Nick and Mark, as you were talking and you were showing the um, discrete choice, sort of where people would choose this or that, this or that, it was, it was reminding me of, could that potentially be modified to be used as a decision aid for potential participants when they're during informed consent during the process? Like, to, to help them to make the decision partic to participate. Because I saw things in there like, if you chose this treatment, potentially this would be the outcome or that's what the evidence is showing. Um, has that been thought of or discussed at all? Uh, yeah, Davis, there's a, there's a bit of work I know about. I, don't, I wouldn't know all of the, all the research, but um, I work quite closely with sort of patient decision aids and there are people now developing those decision aids you know, for participation in, in trials. And I think that there are a lot of similarities because in a sense, you're, what you're trying to do is you're trying to inform people about what you might expect, which is challenging, right? And going into a trial, it's very hard to describe to patients what you might expect. And there's this whole fear of the unknown and the unfamiliar. And so there's time that's spent sort of describing those outcomes. Um, and then sort of like providing this choice. This is the, the option that's available to you. Um, and so I think the difference between, there's a, there are some similarities. The differences are that in the, the questions that we ask, we're providing a bit more hypotheticals. So we're, um, uh, we're sort of exploring what could be. So in terms of effect sizes, we would be asking sort of like effect sizes that actually may not be possible, like, or the intervention may not, reasonably meet that, but we'll put that into our discrete choice because then it will help tease out actually how big an effect size is required for people to actually take on this risk of a side effect. And so um, that's the sort of slight sort of nuance between that because we're in a sense in this hypothetical stage, but at the end you could then um, create a decision aid with the sort of actual best guesses of what you're expecting um, to to um to, to see oh great that's really helpful yes and the distinguishing the differences between the two um i think maybe melanie had a question first then jennifer and then we have uh one or two in the chat so melanie go ahead thank you i wanted to ask what the drawbacks you saw i mean what were the problems of having patient participation in the design you've talked about the benefits were there any drawbacks or time constraints or problems that arose from your point of view, yeah, like it's great. It's a it's a great <laughs> it's a great question. I, I, you know, I'm involved in a few of these methods clusters, um, sort of research studies, and yeah. we're sort of like, to be honest, that we're doing this for for many of us for the first time of like involving patients. It sounds crazy, but like this is this is a new thing for economists to be working with patient partners, and partly that's what we've been doing by having these, these types of projects. Like I can say that this project just went extremely well. Um, and I think we just, it just, our patient partners were so helpful and um, it, it really, I'll let Mark speak to in, in a second or any other things. Um, and not all projects have gone so smoothly and partly it's about just sort of understanding everyone's role. There's that sort of like, 
really unhealthy sort of power dynamic with all these projects and sort of just being sort of upfront about who makes the decisions. I guess one observation I'd have on this, Mark, you want to pick up on it. It, it probably did slow us down a little bit because in a sense, we we were kind of keen. We, we, we Maybe we would have just carried on forward a bit quicker, but having the patient partner saying pause, they want to understand exactly what's going on before we move forward. It potentially did um, slow things down a bit, but at the, you know, the benefit has been, we probably ended up with much more relevant and better products in the end. So again, there's trade-offs in that. Mark, anything else to, to add on this? Yeah, it's, as Nick said, it's a, it's like a very, a very powerful and valuable experience that we had. So it's difficult to sort of think about things that didn't go well because I think, I think it went well. But I think, I think one of the things that struck me, like a number of different stages in the process, was that the systems we have aren't really set up for um, patient involvement right from the outset. So you you feel like a, a bit worried asking people to spend time sort of writing a research proposal that might not get funded and then you're not sure how you'll where, where you'll reimburse the time for because you want to sort of respect people's time and make sure that they're they're sort of reimbursed for that time and then I think the whole process as well like we yeah Nick, the, the uh, Nick was saying that the time is one thing like if you're impatient I don't think it's going to work um, and we've done research in the past, as Nick says, where we've not fully included patients. And for example, with the focus groups that we ran, we would invite people to come and participate in Vancouver. And um, it seemed like quite a smooth process in the past. But um, we were challenged that by our patient partners, you know, there's, there's people who can't get to Vancouver who have very different um, perspectives and different experiences of healthcare. And, and so we kind of redesigned that process of focus groups to allow remote participation, which doesn't seem like a, a big deal in this, this world at the moment. But at the time, it was kind of like a methodic, methodological shift about how do we use something like Zoom to get people in so they can give their perspectives wherever they are in the province. And, and we got a much broader uh, representation of people's perspectives. And perhaps that's why some of the, the things that we might not have thought to be so important about the, the support for people from multiple multidisciplinary teams and the logistics and the costs came through more strongly than they perhaps would do. Um, and then I think the other thing on the time front was that you kind of realise going back to the systems as well that we have set up that it's, it's we, we kind of expect to work in the times that are more convenient for us and you have to redesign your work day in, in a lot of ways to make it work so we were having um, meetings at in sort of evenings and weekends and, and realizing that if you're going to involve patient partners that they have a day-to-day -day lives that they're dealing with and then they've, they've got their um, uh, their condition to manage as well so you have to sort of be a lot more flexible and a lot more patient but I think the, the rewards are kind of hugely hugely valuable and it's been a really exciting and, and insightful project from our perspective. Thank you. <laughs> um, Jennifer did you still have a question? Um, yes thanks. Thanks, Alison. Um, thanks, Nick and Mark. That was a really interesting uh, presentation and the findings um, definitely have me kind of thinking about how they might apply to um, um, kind of older adults and um, exercise interventions. But I was just wondering if you might be able to comment on um, how you suggest kind of resolving the, the disconnect between kind of um, um, kind of the the pressure to demonstrate traditional trial outcome metrics and um, and then kind of this movement towards considering um, this maybe complementary approach that integrates patients um, you know in considering that do you think there's maybe a need for um, um, you know establishing um, what what might be considered me measures for success from from the patient perspective um, that maybe could complement the traditional outcome metrics? Um, thanks, thanks, Jen. That's a tricky question to answer, but I think 
it is changing it is changing the, the dynamic of, of of what is defining success i think what i, I think it, it should this stuff should be happening earlier like the thing that's frustrating is that when you have a trial that reports and you could have and you know, you could have told from the start before this trial even started recruiting that actually the results were not necessarily set up in a way that were going to be useful. And that's just so frustrating. You know, that, that patients who participate in this trial of a design that we know is probably not going to impact practice. And so I think the, the, the impact of this I see as more relevant to sort of like the design or the funding stage of a trial. And like our barriers for funding a trial should change and they shouldn't just be based on um, the, you know, the, the correct sort of statistics for effect size or things like this. They need to sort of demonstrate that actually this, this trial will have value beyond the end. And I, I do think that would be a new metric. Like it's sort of somewhat considered in sort of peer review of trials. And I guess here we're talking about publicly funded trials. I see there's a question in the chat about um, uh, kind of private funded studies, but from a publicly funded study, I just think this, this should be uh, uh, a criteria that is, that is uh, a con considered in, 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 in that before it's even funded. Um, and I haven't really thought about it. Well, I have thought about it. Is it different from a private versus public perspective? It would be my sort of like response to that. Thank you. So Nick or Mark, there, there was that comment in the chat around, you know, the industry funded trials. And I mean, I suppose there's an economic argument here to make that it this could save them a, a lot of money in that feasibility and planning stage. And there's also some um, international guideline changes at the ICH that will be coming requiring patient input into the earliest stages of, of the industry um, trial planning. So do you have thoughts on like, how do we sort of bring these methods to those industry and pharma companies? Yeah, I think I think it relates. It's, it's interesting those changes like um, that are coming. They're not very well defined. So, and I think it's, it links to Ben's question here about you know what is what is patient involvement, and people have very different sort of views and definitions of that. And I think probably pharma companies will take a view on that. I think what we're sharing here is a method that could be part of that, but that's not the only. This is just to be clear, just this part of what patient involvement in, in a trial design would be. Um, there's, there's all sorts of other perspectives and places that patients can be involved in. Um, I, I had an interesting chat with someone in pharma and they claimed publicly that, you know, they do a lot of market research, but mostly it's with, with, it's with clinicians, it's with the prescriber. That's, that's in the end, who's going to use this, this sort of like promote this treatment. And until uh, things change such that, that patients have a bit more autonomy in the sense of, um, of how that, um, uh, how, how, how they can choose the treatments that they're provided, that, 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 may, may, not, that may not change very quickly. But I do think what we have in one sense is we can help, if somebody has a design of a trial uh, and they're worried about sort of how many people they might, they might recruit. I think we could quickly inform them of who, how many people they might recruit and actually what tweaks, the impact of tweaking the design might have on their recruitment rates. And I think that will be practical for, for public and private sort of trials moving forward. Absolutely. So highlighting that practical application and uh, is really important. So I know we only have about a minute left and I'm wondering, Mark and Nick, would you be willing to answer if we save the chat questions to answer those at a later date, those ones that you sort of had um, some commentary on and, and we could share that back with the uh, attendees? Absolutely, I'm just gonna put my email again in the chat. Mark, you could do that the same. 
but um, please feel free also to sort of connect with me if you've got any questions and um, yeah, we'd be happy to answer any of these um, uh, beyond this time. Fantastic. Well, thank you again, both for um, presenting this work to us today. And um, it's been a fantastic discussion as well. Really appreciate it. And I hope that um, everybody enjoys the rest of the day. And yes, I'll leave this open. I see Bev, you've got a question too. I'll, I'll stay on for a little bit and keep the chat open if anybody would like to add some more questions. Thank you so much. Great, well, thank you everyone. And uh, I look forward to continuing to sort of engage with these, uh, these discussions over the next coming months. Thanks so much for your time. Yeah, likewise, thank you everyone. And thanks for the questions. It's been great to have the opportunity to present. So Nick, you'll stay on and, and join us for the additional um, community of practice engagement. Mark, is that something you were interested in as well or? Uh, I can do that. Yeah, I, I, was, I wasn't sure the, um, you know, what the schedule was for today. Yeah, so I can, I can stay for a bit if that's, that's fine. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I was thinking about, so we're having, we're planning to have these, hey, Larry and Melanie, they're part of it, uh, the practice and Taylor, the community of practice we're sort of forming and we're looking at meeting every uh, second Tuesday of the month to talk all things patient engagement and clinical trials. And so it's informally, we, I think the next meeting in March, we'll just talk about what ideas everybody has and what it might look like. So I don't have you on the recurring meetings. I don't know if you wanted us to send, to include you. Well, maybe I'll leave I'll leave Nick to this, and then because uh, I, I speak to Nick a lot, so it probably makes more sense to have him involved, and I'll I'll sort of scoot off. But if you want me to be involved in the future, um, either you or Nick can tell me. Sounds great. But yeah. <laughs> All right. Anyway, thank you very much. So I'll, uh, I'll speak to you soon. Thanks, you. Mark. Bye. Bye, Larry. Hi. That was great. Nick, that was a really interesting presentation. I've, this, I've not really um, got my head wrapped around health economics and how it works. And this is a really good, a good example. Yeah, I hope that's okay. I, it's, it's hard to not let these things just become a Q&A. You know, it's hard to do discussion, isn't it, on Zoom? That's what I'm finding. And I know that's what you'd like to be doing. So, you know, yeah, I hope, I hope that's okay to sort of get things going. Oh, absolutely. I think so. I mean, I think Larry, like, for example, in the community of practice, I think we have about 11 or 12 of us. So and maybe we'll have a few more by March that we maybe we'll have some times where we can have just sort of chat more in depth and, you know, express thoughts or ideas. And, and then other times we're thinking maybe we'd have more formal presentations and open it up a bit. But that's, you know, we're thinking maybe we'll talk more about that at the next meeting and see what people think they what what you want to do, right? Like, how will we get the most out of this? Because we have a lot of people really interested in um, chatting and learning and learning more and moving the practice along, right? Larry, I mean, mm. what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, one of the things about this, Nick, is presentations. We, ha we have a set mind, um, a mindset, I guess, about how presentations run. So if we're going to design some sort of collaborative meeting, then we need to have those tools in place and the thought in place. And that takes a bit of work and effort, you know, whereas not, not that presentations don't take work and effort too, but it's a different sort of thing, right? Different goals. Yeah. So, yeah. Yep. And I think that's, you know, one of the things that we're going to be thinking about in the future once we get up and running is find, start to just you know, figure out what people want out of this meeting, right? Because we're not even sure exactly what that's going to be yet. I'm disappointed that Heidi and Melanie disappeared. And Bev, did they not know that we were staying on or? Well, I don't think we formally planned to. I was just staying on to keep the chat open. And um, if right. anyone had any last questions. Um, okay. But yeah. Nick, should would you like me to send you the the chat in? Uh, I'm not quite sure how I reply though. Like, do I like? I don't know what the right forum is to do that. And like, yeah, some I mean, of them are a little bit like some of the questions are, you know, 
a bit broad like how do you do how do you operationalize this it's like well that's quite a big yeah. That's quite a big that's, question. So, that's what we want to talk about. I mean, yeah. one of the thoughts I can I can pull them out in the chat and send them to you. If there's yeah. any you think of, then what I'd do is I'd just email the some basic responses to everybody that attended and maybe we, Larry, we can put some links to some other resources that the support unit potentially has, because I think some of those questions are fairly broad, right? That are beyond what the topic was today. Yeah, and I don't know if that's actually something that was intended to be answered by you guys today. I think that was more, uh, these are discussion points to me. So these could actually, instead of being questions that we try to answer now, they can be topics for future meetings. And they, they could be actual true discussions because there are no answers to these questions, right? I mean, like you can, you can sort of apply some of these questions to your own particular project and how it worked for you which is a typical way that you do with deal with answers like and questions in a presentation. But I think that the value in these questions are sort of pointing in the direction of what are the future topics that we're going to not need to talk about. And we could actually in, make a list of an, an ongoing list in our community of practice of, of topics that we want to talk about. And some of those topics are going to be discussed in group, small groups. We could, you know, set up, um, you know, like a world cafe type thing where we have questions and everyone can go around and ask these, look at these questions and come up with some of the key points that we need to address and more areas of inquiry. And then based on that, we can say, who, who do we need to invite to present at a meeting that can sort of speak to these topics? So that's kind of what, how, that was my, in, you know, envisioning yeah. of how a community practice would go. Yeah. I got, just so you know, I'll put in the chat, I got contacted by these folks yeah, I don't know if you've come across them, mm. um, but there's this European group that is seemingly rather well funded. I think they've got both industry and public funding, but they're in a sort of similar-ish sort of space, like from what our line of, of doing this is. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, I just sort of, I, I don't want to kind of I think I think it's good to sort of let let these things emerge a little bit from from our community here, but I also do think that there's an opportunity as well of um, pushing this not only as a sort of a place for us to collaboratively learn together, but also to sort of like market ourselves as uh, a place that becomes of you know leading thoughts on on the whole spectrum which is we talked before Alison there's there's a lot to this like our what, what our interest is one narrow part of it but but yeah I just sort of interested to sort of see where it could sort of it might be useful to think about where this might go yeah. and um yeah this group quite interesting in terms of um what they're doing and they seem to yeah, it just shows you perhaps like I don't really know I, I've not worked with industry at all and but you know I, I it looks like this group is taking a lot of money from industry to sort of to help them tackle these questions alongside it so i don't know i just want to sort of no i i uh, think it's important nick because with the ich changes what it's meaning we're seeing it already industry has to take notice now and industry has to figure this out where i think maybe in some of the grant funded and academic world they're further along in this space um, maybe because funding agencies have um, supported that. I'm not sure what all, and you know, community-based research and all the other things that Larry um, would be more familiar about. My background is in industry and, and sort of doing trials in that space more. And the, the link you sent, Innovative Medicines, we have an Innovative Medicines Canada, and they do provide funding and advocacy and work in the space. And I see the chair of this group is a GS, a Novartis person, maybe. I mean, we have something like that in Canada. Um, it might be worth at some point just going to reach out and having a meeting or doing a presentation with them. One of the things that we've been started to be asked is from industry, our local biotech companies, they're like, we need to find patient partners or we need to connect with patient advisory groups. Can you help us do that? We've never done that before as industry, right? So there's, there's a growing emerging space that maybe we can get a little bit ahead of. Yeah, yeah. So 
something we can talk about. Perhaps that is a topic. They actually put, you know, like, industry they engagement. They, this has got 12, 12 million euro. Six six <laughs> million is is European funding, and six million is industry funding. That's like, you know, that's pretty mm. big, big money there. So yeah, it's interesting that that's what's going on over there. So they've asked me to talk to them. So I, I've asked them. I, I don't generally do any sort of work with industry, so I've just asked them the terms of that. So, sure. yeah, if I find out any more, I'll, I'll let you know. Yeah, I mean, maybe we have, we'll have that opportunity. Maybe if, if that goes well and you feel comfortable with that and think it was valuable, we could maybe make a similar offer and connect with the local Canadian version of that group. And um, they do fun projects and they do have an ethical uh, code of conduct in the way they do that. And it's pretty... It's pretty good. Like I, I feel pretty comfortable with the work they're doing. Um, so that's that's a good way to do it, where you're not engaging with a single company. Yeah, it's like a group. So it's actually probably a better approach than just say working and getting a grant from a single industry uh, funder, because they will also provide grants for projects like this to help develop it. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. So. I'm, I'm yeah, and that's going to, you know, I'm, I'm sure the idea of engaging with the industry is going to be something that will be very controversial and this community of practice will have lots to say about it, about how that's handled, right? I mean, there's even one of the questions about that, you know, so I think it, it will come up. And we have that whole notion of professional patients now in the U.S. There are companies that you can hire to get, you know, your right patient partner. You pay through the nose for it, but you get that right person and it's become... You know, source of income for people. So, those are going to be issues that we're going to need to talk about. Yes, yes, and I really like that idea of taking the chat and using that, reviewing that at our next meeting to come up with some topics. So maybe that's what, maybe that's where we start for next time and have an expanded version of this discussion. Right. Perfect. So you've collected the, that information already. Are you going to put it on on our? What, are you we'll going to do it on the team's, team's channel? Yeah, mm -hmm. instead of ECOS. I'll post you know. it. Yeah, I'll post it on the Teams. Nick, are you comfortable navigating and working in the team space? Yeah, like so, I use Teams, but I find I find it a bit odd when I I have to go between two different. Oh, I see that you've added me. So now, so now it's three. Yeah, I, I don't get updates. So if I switch between my mm. UK teams and then my other teams, I yeah. seem to be quite separate and screw everything up. So it just yeah, I, I won't necessarily see what's going on because I tend to be in the UBC Teams one most of the time. Maybe I've got a setting I can use. But yeah, I'm happy for yeah. things to be posted. Teams, you know, one of, the pro one of the problems for me for Teams is that if I go into Teams and start doing stuff in Teams, it, it crashes and it crashes my other programs. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons why I don't like Teams. And I noticed that that happens with other people. Like Lynn, for example, she, she hates using Teams. Um, but... but uh, but if everyone's comfortable doing it, and if it works for everyone, you gotta get happier IT to fix that for you, Larry, and make you happy. Yeah, well, the they, happier has been. Very, so we have it a, the IT. <laughs> the IT people have been very good with me. I think I've probably, you know, spent a quarter of their time. <laughs> a lot you and us. Gene probably yeah. half fifty percent between the two of you. <laughs> I spent actually about two months ago. I spent an entire Monday in December with. Uh, Edmund on Teams. Was it Edmund? Edward? And I can't remember him now. But uh, yeah, going through my, we actually ended up updating my operating system. So my computer is just too old. That's the problem. I need to update it. But anyway, yeah, so communication is, is you know, it's important. And if Teams works, that's great. We could do a combination of ECOPS because we might have on the ECOPS, we might have our core group of, of support unit people who can keep it a, an eye on that. Um, and then that way we know how we're sort of leading the larger group. And whereas the larger group might be more about, you know, communication for all the members. I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, well, I've got to go to my next thing, yeah. which is exercise class. Woo -hoo. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, well, yeah, let me know, Alison, if, if you want any, I can do some input for the next meeting if you want to write a some questions down or some things like that. I'm happy to just let me know. I'm happy to be guided by your by you on this. Awesome. Yeah. No, it's really going to be a lot. The input from the group, the things you're meant both mentioning here, I think will develop. Yeah. 
And it was a good turnout too, so perfect. It was a good turnout, yeah. Good. All right, see you guys, take care. Thanks Thank again. You. Thank Bye. you.